The BBC presents Vintage Goons, another in the series of programmes first broadcast to British listeners in 1954. In an endeavour to prove that radio is not blind, we present, after a successful season at Routon House, another programme in the series which, by careful planning, meticulous writing and superb presentation, has managed to avoid winning the Radio Award. <laughs> Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe and Spike Milligan in... The Goon Show! My name is Dudley Prynne, contemporary armchair detective. Tonight from my casebook, I'd like to tell you the story gone out of a crime that shook England. Here to tell you more is the man who remembers it all. Thank you, Dudley. I'm not the man who remembers it all, so I'll step down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Every now and again, there occurs a crime that makes us sit up. For some time now, the goons have had access to Scotland Yard's secret files, thanks to an arrangement with the police known as Dropsy, <laughs> known uh, in the Americas as Graft. From these confidential files comes a story of a crime that no Sunday newspaper would dare to print, the story of the dreaded piano clubber. It was such a winter's night as this when I, Lance Constable Ned Seagorn of Long Division, London River Police, was patrolling the river. <laughs> I'll be glad when we get a launch, Sergeant. <laughs> it is a bit chilly, I admit, swimming. I still we must guard our great river, the Thames. Yes. <laughs> We better walk up the embankment and get dry before we go in again. Explain an idea, Jim. Explain an idea. <laughs> oh, what was that type noise? It sounded like a piano. Make a note. Two ladies already made them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no ad living feet. What the? Ah! It came from over there. Quick, after over there. Body in the gutter. Oh, hmm. Quick, Sergeant. <laughs> Take down these notes and description. Right. Description. Five feet two. Five foot two. Short, tubby. Short, short, tubby. Wearing blue trousers and jacket. Good looking. Right. That takes care of me. Now. <laughs> <laughs> the body. Anybody Wearing come? city suit. Yes. Bowler hat and bowler trousers. Yes. Carrying ear trumpet, side whiskers, bald, sex. <laughs> Mail! <laughs> Search his pocket, Jim. Right. Oh. Ah. Five pounds and half crowns. Oh. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Not a word of the inspector. Oh, you want some? The crook. <laughs> no, no, no. Here's a birth certificate in his hip pocket. Dad! According to this, his hip pocket's 130 years old. <laughs> so this might not be murder after all. This man might have died from natural causes. Oh, I don't think he's died from either, Jim. Why not? He's getting up, Jim. <laughs> oh. <laughs> have you got all that down? Every word, Jim. <laughs> Splendid. Uh, Easy, old man. Where am I? England, sir. England? Then I'll wave me an England. At long as England. Thank you, yes, yes, thank you very much. Yes. Thank no. you. No. I didn't hear the rest of the words. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> no. What happened, sir? I fainted. Fainted when? Just after a man struck me down with a piano. Struck? With a piano? Yes. What fiendish ingenuity. Did you get the number of the instrument? No, he had his lights out. <laughs> but I can describe the man. Good. Take this down. Right, sir. He was wearing trousers. Got them down? No, it's still chilling. <laughs> a shirt, a tie, a jacket, a hat, stuck 
And one pair of shoes. One pair. Splendid. With that description, if ever he enters a nudist colony, he's a goner. <laughs> you were a goner in the last world, weren't you, Jim? Yes. Anything else about the piano club you noticed? Yes, he was carrying a piano and this recording of Max Gerardo. I see. Thank you, Ronfield. <laughs> the second time the dreaded piano club has struck. In the months to come, he struck 28 times. Each time he struck his victim with a piano. Each time he crept up on his victim from behind. And each time his victim was Henry Crumb. <laughs> public opinion demanded a public inquiry. Order, please, order. Now, the inquiry will now be conducted regarding the activities of an unknown assailant, the dreaded piano clubber. First witness... My name is Captain Bluebottle. <laughs> Thank you, friends of Bluebottle. Now, Prolonco. Silence, silence. Stop that singing and I'll stop playing this guitar. I now... I hear you. <laughs> you mind? Now, give your evidence. All right, then. On the night of the attack, I was walking down Bonjes Lane when suddenly I stopped. Why? Hmm? Why, I said. I don't know. I must have been tired. <laughs> My little touches were steaming after certain rock and roll dances, you see. Mm -hmm. And when you stopped, you saw then uh, the victim, uh, the victim, Mr. Crun was laying in the gutter, yes? Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. And escaping over a wall was a man carrying a wooden tart piano. But, Mr. Bluebottle, didn't you request the man with the piano to stop? No, because he wasn't playing it. <laughs> All right, sit down. Next, please. Sit down next, please. Next witness, uh, William Slit from <laughs> USA. Oh, William Slit. Oh, William Raise your right leg and say after me, I swear. Oh, I swear. I also you drink. You lousy, and... rotten stink. <laughs> I also drink and smoke. I also drink and smoke. Take the stand now. I, I... Now, you have come a long way to give evidence. All the way from New Orleans. <laughs> the fair cost me every penny I had, mate. New Orleans is 234,560 miles away, and we appreciate you making this long journey. Uh, now, on the night of the crime, where were you? I was in New Orleans, 234,567 <laughs> miles away. Next witness. Call <laughs> Minnie oh, Bannister. My name is Minnie Bannister. Spinnerist Spinister. Madam, what is your association I... with Mr. Crumb? Oh. Man, man, man and woman. Are you related? Yes. I'm I'm his auntie, you know. And uh, he's my nephew. Oh, it sounds feasible. Oh, it um, is. It is. It is. Now, now, what are your occupations? Oh, well, Henry collects foreign stamps, and I knock my knees together. Gad, what a den of vice. <laughs> Miss... Nicky, knocky, 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 no, I That's don't. That's quite enough, please. Oh. Miss Bannister, after Mr. Crown was first struck by this piano, uh, did you notice any change in him when he arrived home? Yes, his hat was jammed over his eyes. <laughs> well, I take it that this was caused by the force of the piano landing on his head. Oh, yes. And, and, after... and an upsurge of head. Lumps. 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 
morning. 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 Morning, Your Honor. And after the morning. Oh, I'm sorry. And after that. Did he put anything inside his hat to absorb the shock? Yes. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I object. I object. You object. To what do you object, Mr. Crum? I object to being struck on the head by Tanner. Objection sustained. Lumps. Lumps. Oh. <laughs> I need the cock. <laughs> I have said objection sustained. That's quite enough. Not that I find any reason to continue with this inquiry, as the information obtained is of a sketchy nature. We will therefore wait until further attacks have taken place. I object to further attacks. I object to them. Mr. Crun, you want us to find the assailant? Yes, and the piano club. Then you must let the attacks continue. If we don't find him, he might attack you again. Very well, sir, but next time I shall vote communist, I tell you. The attacks continued at the rate of one per week, and the weeks occurred at five per month. <laughs> but the piano club had always managed to escape us. Then he struck Crun in a new and terrible manner. With the loud pedal down. No? <laughs> Struck by a piano with a loud pedal down. England was horrified. The BBC gave out warnings. Police are appealing to the public to help track down the dreaded piano clubber. If you are hit by a piano, please don't hush it up. Tell a policeman. <laughs> Make sure you are never on the streets alone. It is known that he never makes his attacks inside a building. So if, like myself, you work indoors, you are... The dreaded piano club had struck inside the BBC, struck down an innocent announcer, causing John Snyder to do double duties. <laughs> Special precautions were taken. To soothe the nation, records were played. Here is the Ray Ellington Quartet. <laughs> oh, and I'm mad in Spartan. Yes, the dreaded piano club had struck again. Under pressure, Parliament would assemble to pass new laws. Yes, yes, gentlemen. You may well, you, you, you may well debate this matter. The, 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 the problem is, under the, under the circumstances, what are you saying behind it? <laughs> I, I, I haven't finished it, please. Oh, I'm I said no, that the, the problem is, under, under the circumstances, does the piano become a lethal weapon? I, I say, I say, I say yes. Definitely, Mr. Kerf. Yes, yes. <laughs> The piano should be categorized as a lethal weapon. Anybody caught hiding a piano on their person should be taken into custody. Yes, the honorable member's suggestion that people arrived in this country should be searched for hidden pianos. I, I am sure I am. You're ahead on this. But, uh, wait a minute. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I think it's all a lot of rubbish for the whole thing. How in heaven's name could a man hide a piano on himself? How, he come in How can he? Look, anybody who's struck down by this dreadful piano club must be blind. I tell you, a full-size piano, my dear. Well, uh, I ask you, well, is, it, is, there, well, is, it, is it not possible to see the man coming towards you? And it's a... <laughs> Don't panic. I say, I say, old man, help me lift this piano off the private as you... Yes, even in Parliament, the dreaded piano club had struck. Then suddenly in December, without warning, the violent attacks violently ceased. He was obviously having the instrument retuned. <laughs> the police immediately swooped on every piano tuner in London. Ah, here's another piano tuner in London, Mr. Crump. Yes, I wonder if we shall have any luck this time. Yes. Uh, uh, nobody about in the shop. Is there anybody in? Yes, me. Who are you? Mr. Cran, I came in with you. Splendid! <laughs> Mr. Cran, there's only you and me. Good, good, good. In any case, whoever works in this dreadful, filthy piano shop must be right off his head. Yes. I, I wonder who he is. Hold on, do I do know who he is? <laughs> oh, hello, good evening. Good evening. I would not. Uh, you want to buy a piano? I'm looking for a criminal. Oh, that's one mic I haven't got. <laughs> no, silly. I, I wouldn't buy a piano with this hovel. What? I've kept a hovel? My shop a hovel? Oh. <laughs> oh, no, 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 my man. This is a, a very elegant shop. This is famous, famous men come here, my man. Famous men. So, here, do you know who comes here? No. Monsieur Spall de Groin. <laughs> Is, is, is he famous? No, but he comes here. <laughs> <laughs> Frighten him. Tell him. 
Tell him who you are. Oh, That's a good idea. <clears throat> I got the, I got the lot of. I'm Seagoon from Scotland Yard. Oh, I'm Michael from Coney Hut. Here. <laughs> Have a leather potato. I made it myself. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> you, I you, 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 I you, potatoes all over me. Yes. I'm like, put, 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 potato. No. Oh. Spud. Oh. Look here, you don't understand. I, I'm looking for a person who has been committing crimes against the British public by using a piano with force. Oh, in it for that wool. Oh, that's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> I was warned that this is a case of ipso facto corin carborundum filio. Oh. <laughs> What do all them words mean, then? I don't know, but they make me sound intelligent. <laughs> In any case, they fool you. Oh, yeah, well, when you need to use such long words, small words fool me just a thing. <laughs> you, 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 you say this is a piano shop. This is a piano shop. Then, plunk, 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 plunk. Oh, thank you. Peter. Now, explain that notice in your window. The one that says, for sale, African elephants, house train. You just got through that, didn't you? Yes. African elephant, African elephant, house train. <laughs> Oh, wait, I don't stock anything like that. I never have. But listen, supposing people saw that notice, came in here and asked for a elephant. What happens then? <laughs> Hello. I just say, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't got one. But that's mad. I know, but your ability costs nothing, I see. <laughs> I give way to your superior ignorance. Good luck. <laughs> Do you mind if we inspect your pianos? Go ahead. It shouldn't take long. Why not? I haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Oh, yes, sir. I've got this one here. <laughs> That's a piano. That's the one. That's the very one that struck me down. Are you positive? Yes, the dent in the back fits me perfectly. <laughs> then we've got him. I have a constant watch kept at the shop. As soon as he calls to collect it, it's curtains. I don't sell any curtains. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up. <laughs> So they waited. One day, two, three, a week, two weeks, a fortnight, a month, two months, a year, two years, three, ten, twenty, thirty, forty years, forty-five years. We began to get a nasty feeling that he might not be coming back. <laughs> then one midnight as we watched, a night-shirted figure in curlers ran out of the piano shop shouting, Help! Help! What are you? Help! <laughs> steady, steady. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> Mad damn. Settle down, boy. Now, what's happened? The piano club is piano. It's gone. It was stolen while I was asleep. Are you sure? Oh, of course I'm sure. I was sleeping on it. What key were you sleeping in? I was sleeping in A flat. Capitalist. I got the money. However, the piano club can't be far away. The show only lasts another few minutes. Lalkana! We are here. We are waiting. What is it? This is no time for witty sallies, Lalkana. Where are you? Here, sir. Here. Silence when you answer me. Silence for you, especially. Mr. Lalkika. What is it you want? I want you to head the dreaded piano club off. You got your whistle? Right. If he hits you with his piano, give a loud blast and blow your whistle. Supposing I am getting killed, though. Then give three blasts and lay in the direction of down. <laughs> Is that clear? Now he tells me. All right, all right, all right. Spread it to your duty. Wait. Listen. <laughs> Did you hear that? The piano club has sixed a tune. It came from down that street. Well done, <laughs> While our heroes are seeking out the piano clever, I'd like to tell you current BBC news. The Deputy Light Controller of Overseas Home Service Programs has become engaged to Ethel Kroll. And this has caused quite a stir as Ethel Kroll is married to Fred Ponk, outside broadcast engineer. It promises to be quite an interesting battle of wits. I think that the snippets of news show that the corporation is not without its thrills. We return now to the mundane goon show, who have now sighted the piano clubber. Oh. I'm glad he finished. <laughs> there he is. In an alley. I'll get him when he plays again. Got him! I got him in his sonata in G minor. After him! Follow the trail! The trail led them to a lonely Armenian lapis lazuli <laughs> villa in Piccadilly Circus. He must be around here somewhere. I tell you, I don't like the look of it. Well, stop looking at it then. Oh! Ow! Ow! 
somebody threw a stone in my head and it hit me right on the head. Yes. yes. And there's a piece of paper wrapped around it. My head? It's got writing on it. What's it say? Sorry, Eccles, I meant to hit Seagull. <laughs> Signed the dreaded piano clubber. And it came from the top window. Hand me my telecoop. Gab, it's Count Peel's Moriarty. <laughs> Come down, Count, or we'll throw Eccles at you. Oh, no, not that. I'll come down with my hands up. <laughs> Eccles, keep him covered. Oh, I've got a blanket. <laughs> come on, Mary, I'll tell you. Don't shoot me. Don't, don't shoot me. I've got a headache. <laughs> Explain to us and the listeners the reason you attacked Mr. Crumb with the piano. Well, I was on the... Let me, allow me to do the talking, Mary, I'll tell you. I have the teeth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly who are you? I'm exactly Gritpide Thin, his lawyer. How do you spell it? Lawyer, lawyer. <laughs> I mean, how do you spell grit pipe thin? S M I T H. Why do you spell it like that? I'm in disguise, you see. Inspector <laughs> Moriarty attacked Crown for a piece of string. You risk life imprisonment for a piece of string? I have to have it. My trousers are coming down. <laughs> Lalkaka, take these men away and end the story. All right, all right. Take word. At last, the piano clever under lock and key. <laughs> Let's leave it there for the moment. I have been asked by the BBC governors to explain for the benefit of nervous listeners that the piano clubber is only a fictitious character, so please don't go to bed thinking about him as he is. <laughs> uh, good night, everyone. <laughs> The BBC presents Vintage Goons, another in the series of programmes first broadcast to British listeners in 1954. <laughs> The Goon Show, folks! Yes, folks! Yes, folks! Thank you, folks. Thank you, Victor Sylvester. <laughs> and now for an encore, Mr. Webster Smogpule will sing that lovely Mongolian saxophone solo for Cor Anglais and Cor Blamy, I Lost My Teeth in a Monastery Garden by Hurlston. <laughs> We would like to announce that this was Smog Pule's farewell appearance. <laughs> but now to this week's great feature, a story of a mighty cannon designed to win the Crimean War. Here then is the saga of the giant Bombardom, or the giant Bombardom, or the story of this great Bombardom commences in the year 1853, the year of the Crimean War, the year that gave Anne Eagle her big chance. <laughs> It is midnight in the winter HQ of Major Bradnock VC. The British Army, Balaclava. The enemy are only a stone's throw away. <laughs> Curse them, they've thrown another stone. <laughs> Lord Cardigan, plug that hole up. This is the third winter in four months in this devilish place. Three fiscal years fighting those Ruskies. <laughs> they must be in the red. It looks bad. Yes, it might even lead to war. <laughs> Pass me the marlin, lad. Pass me the brandy, will you? Hark! I hear horses' hooves. It's somebody galloping down the road. Who is it? It's a man with coconut shells strapped to his feet. 
Economical devil. <laughs> Let me see. Well, he looks like a messenger from the front, and he looks like one from the back as well. <laughs> Let him in by letting him in. Oh, bad news. Oh, oh, oh. Who are you? I'm Phyllis Siegel of the third athlete's foot. I am... <laughs> I am Bloodknock of the Second Royal Knees. <laughs> Seagull? Wait a minute. Seagull? I didn't recognize you. Uh, you know him, sir? No, that's why I didn't recognize you. <laughs> oh, groan, 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 groan. Ah, oh, oh, groan, oh, groan. He's wounded with groans. <laughs> Quick, the brandy. Yeah. Now, steady now. Drink this. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I never could stand the sight of blood, you know. I'm all right, sir. It's only a flesh wound. Oh, it looked like a bullet wound to me. <laughs> the Russians, sir. What? The Russians have attacked heavily and after a five-day battle against superhuman odds, I fear the third dismounted foot of Malthusili has retreated. Retreated? A British regiment retreated? How much? A quarter of an inch. <laughs> retreated a whole quarter of an inch. Yes. What made them panic like this? <laughs> they lost that colonel, sir. He's... he's dead. Colonel Splun dead? Dead! Oh, how did that happen? He was killed. <laughs> killed? Do you think that's what caused his death? <laughs> I'm not a doctor, sir. What a coincidence. How did he die? Well, sir, the battle started at dawn ten days ago. The Ruskies attacked Colonel Spun's troops, but they held grimly. Stout fella. But then the Cossacks charged Colonel Spun's troops, but he, he drove them back at nightfall. Stout fella. Well, he's very thin, really. <laughs> then the, the Russian artillery bombarded his troops for two days, but they budged not an inch. So it went on for ten days, my love. Ten days it went on for. Colonel Spun's lad held firm and finally scattered the attackers with cold steel. It is then I learned that Colonel Spun was dead. What a hero. <laughs> yes. Tell us, tell us, lad, how did he die? He, he was hiding in the naffy with a tear and fell on his nut. <laughs> A soldier's death. Oh. I hope he died with his boots on. Why? He had holes in his socks. <laughs> I don't wish to know that. Will you, Arga, will you? <laughs> Things look bad, though, you know. Those Ruskies, they seem to have endless supplies of arms and legs. <laughs> Early this morning, they brought 300 new cannons. Are you sure? Are you sure? Here's the receipt. <laughs> You're right. This war will last as long as Ruskies are safe behind the walls of Sebastopol. What we need is a giant artillery mortar that will breach the walls. Lieutenant Sigun, here's ten shillings and a pair of tartan socks. Take the next boat back to England and commission the building of a giant leather mortar. A bombardon. Packing my three trunks of Jane Mansfield postcards. <laughs> I did as I was told. Three weeks at sea saw us nearing England. The last night aboard, we had a concert on deck. <laughs> you lick me like a soldier fall upon the field of a battle. <laughs> I draw my sword and fight for my country. <laughs> hey, next night, nice, gentlemen, we have Private Max Gildray, and here he is in the secrets. <laughs> Or a French washing machine. Thank you. I suppose the BBC knows what it's doing. <laughs> In London, 
Lieutenant Seagoon was given voice in a House of Commons special session. And furthermore, there is discontent among the troops. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Seagoon. What? <laughs> you say there is discontent among the troops? Yes, there is discontent among the troops. Huh? Yeah. Why do you say there is discontent among the troops? Because there is discontent among the troops. I think. You say there is discontent among the troops? Because there is discontent among the troops. Yes. I said there is discontent among the troops because there is discontent among the troops. Yes. Well, it all sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, gentlemen, the most pressing need in the Crimea is the heavy artillery mortar for siege purposes. You see, the Russian-held city of Sebastopol has walls 20 feet thick. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, they are, they are. Um, Lieutenant Seagull, you say the walls of Sebastopol are 20 feet thick? Yes! <laughs> Why did you say that? Because the walls of Sebastopol are 20 feet thick. You say the walls are 20 feet thick? Because they are 20 feet thick. Yes, I say they're 20 feet thick because they are 20 feet thick. Well, you appear confident. Thank you. Good <laughs> luck. To continue, I would like to say... Uh, Lieutenant, a passing thought. Have you ever uh, measured the walls of Sebastopol? <laughs> no. <laughs> then it is possible that the walls are not 20 feet thick. <laughs> It is possible, yes. They might be only 10 feet 6 inches thick. It is possible the walls of Sebastopol are only 10 feet 6 inches thick. You say that it is possible that the walls of Sebastopol are only 10 feet 6 inches thick? Yes! Why do you say that? Because you said it. I said it? Yes! Lieutenant, are you blaming me for the world? <laughs> 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 You're a brave idiot, man. <laughs> then who are you blaming for the walls of Sebastopol being... I can't blame anybody for the walls of Sebastopol being only 10 feet 6 inches thick. But somebody must be responsible for the walls being... Nobody's responsible for the walls of Sebastopol being only 10 feet 6 inches thick. Somebody's responsible for the walls of Sebastopol being Gentlemen, please, please. After all, Lieutenant Seagoon did not say the walls were only ten foot six inches. He said, he said they were twenty feet thick. Twenty feet? Oh. Then what's happened to the other nine feet six inches? What's <laughs> happened to the other nine feet six inches? Thank heavens, they're safe. <laughs> Lieutenant Seagoon, I apologise. I accept your apology. Now then, I do to say... Uh, Lieutenant Seagoon. My life... <laughs> You say you accept my apology? Yes! Why did you say that? <laughs> At midnight, the debate finished. <laughs> and I decided to spend the night at my aunt and uncle's, a dear old couple who, being holders of government gilt edge securities, Lived in a tree in Hyde Park. I got in my soul. I got in my soul. I got feet in my sock and shoes in my nose. Oh, you'll have your herbs in a minute. Ah. Angry! Angry! Not mud and men. What are you doing there, Henry? I'm singing hot rhythm songs, men. I'm rocking round the clock, Min. Don't take it away with that. What's all that other type noise down there? 
I'm watching the dinner plates, me. But they haven't left in here, Henry. Ah, but I'm washing them now so that we won't have to wash them after. <laughs> you must get the plates washed up. Oh, dear, dear, dear. This is my lucky day. This is the... Oh, curse it, I've dropped another one. This is the... Henry! The day I will remember the day I'm... Henry! I'm dying. Are you dying, Henry? They can't take... They can't take this away. Are you calling me, Minnie? Henry? You calling me? Are you calling me? Were you calling me? You calling me, Minnie? Are you calling me, Minnie? I heard you calling me, Henry. 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 I heard you calling who, Minnie? It was a man. What song was he singing? That is my lucky day. Minnie, what? I can hear it, Minnie. You were right. Someone is singing. But it's upstairs, Minnie. Oh, oh. It was a woman's voice, Minnie. No, no, it, it was a man's it, voice. No, it was a woman. It, 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 it was a man's, man's voice. Woman's voice. My lucky day. Was that you? Oh, was that you, Henry? <laughs> no, that was the elephant, Min. What's the elephant doing in the kitchen? Helping Min. <laughs> is he is he drying up? No, he feels quite moist, Min. <laughs> He's cooking the din min. Now, I told you not to let him cook the dinner. You know that's the gorilla's job. <laughs> Shoo, sure, I get out of naughty elephant. Shoo! Sure. Oh, don't. Oh, don't. Oh, oh. oh, oh, you. Oh, you know that elephant was helping me build my giant bombardier in the cellar? I didn't. I don't know. I don't know what. No, I don't know what we want a giant bombardier for. No. Well, if you sleep in the barrel of it, Min... Did you turn in the barrel, Henry? Yes. <laughs> Sleeping in the barrel, Min, it gets rid of rheumatism of the knees, you oh, know. Oh. My uncle slept in a cannon once. Oh, what did it get rid of? It got rid of my uncle, Min. No, there's a plan on my spleen. <laughs> you realise we're lucky, Madam Min. No one else in this street has got a bombardum. Oh! I'll, uh, I'll answer it, Min. I know the way to the door. Uh, oh, it's wrong. Oh, it's shiny, short, and dreadful Neddy. <laughs> Min, uh, back from the China Wars. Come in, let me take that wet wig off. Thank you. Ah, home and beauty. Come on in, darling. Come on and relax. Put your feet up. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that from the standing position. <laughs> you old joker, you. Oh. <laughs> oh. You didn't know me, and I met Lieutenant Seagoon by accident. He ran over me in a steamroller. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gad, happy days, happy, happy days. By the way, what? What's that thing in the cellar? What? Didn't you know I'm building a giant leather bomb, madame? Dear listeners, what luck! The very thing I come to England for! You see, Min, I told you it'd come in handy. Oh, uh, I haven't introduced you to Colonel Rayington here. Uh, how do you do?
government contract, genius Henry Crun set about completing his giant bombardment. Finally, the day of completion arrived. Ah, uh, Seagun, just put this office on, will you? Thank you. It's a bit tight with the armpits. <laughs> yes. Now, I have here a miniature of the bombard arm. Oh. It's loaded, and to show you its angle of projection, I'm going to fire a shot at the target on that door. Splendors! Ah, uh, splendors, just like the fuse, would you? Good morning. I'm shutting. My kitten, you have shutting me. Hey! Falls to the ground, clutches heart area in agony. Loosens knees. Don't, don't be silly, little bottle. It was only a rubber bullet. It's still agony, dear. Why? It went down my throat. <laughs> you swallowed a bullet. Quick, I'll pick you up. Yes, but don't point it with anybody. Oh. <laughs> I have a rubber bullet within. I die. I'm killing you. Hey, that isn't me. I'll fix it. Pass me that mallet. Thank you. Now, Blue Bottle, take your hat off. Okay. Now. Hey. <coughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you banged it up. My captain has saved me. Hooray. Ah, here's the lolly with the iron for the cannonballs. Uh, pardon me, mate. Where do you want all the scrap iron on the iron? The old iron in the, on the uh, lorry, mate, don't you? Throw the lot in this deep smelting pit. Well, give me an hand, then. Right, I'll make the straining noises. Right. Uh, uh, look out for the tennis friendly. Uh, uh, <coughs> oh, God, that was heavy. It ought to be. That was a lorry. <laughs> Fool, why didn't you tell me that was a lorry? Well, I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> my mate borrowed them. Well, you better get him back off him, hadn't you? I can't, he was in the lorry. <laughs> in the lorry! <laughs> of course. <laughs> I suppose he had to steer. He was steer. Pardon me, Jim. Are you taking the mini out of me, Jim? Oh, Jim, the barrels of gunpowder have arrived. <laughs> Well, sun springs. When are they? They were a bit damp. So Wackles is drying the gunpowder out by the fire. That's the last thing you should do. It will be. Here, that gunpowder exploded. <laughs> Thank you, boys. It's been a long time. Oh, thank you. Eagles, still alive? Yep. Yeah. It must be a miracle. Go back and try again. Oh, no, not again. I can't go around having fun all the time, you know. No. Where's my legs going? Yeah, now the oh. trouble is... <laughs> on your head. The trouble is, we're to get another vast quantity of gunpowder. I'd pay anything for it. Ow. We were in Siberia... Uh, Queuing for Sputniks, and um, we happen to hear your chance remarks, sir. I haven't had the pleasure. Allow me to, uh, etc., etc. I'm uh, Grit Pipe Thin, and this is the hairy Count Jim <coughs> Explosions Moriarty. Oh, no. Explosions? You deal in gunpowder then? A far more deadly explosive. What? Licorice powder. <laughs> this is new to me. I demand a demonstration. Moriarty. <laughs> Proof enough. <laughs> yes. Just sign this contract and certificate of slavery, would you? I'll sign with my banjo. And I'll blot it with this piano. <laughs> Have the licorice party delivered on board the HMS Venus. Crun, true to his word, had the giant bombardon completed well behind schedule. In separate brown paper parcels, it was stored in the hold of the HMS Venus. Likewise, the powerful crates of licorice powder post-free. Little does he know that one crate contains Count Jim Moriarty, who will spy for the Russians. Finished? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Caddy McSpran, are you ready to sail? I said I just play a few hairy sea phrases. <laughs> Send up the airlines and pose Diana Doors! <laughs> 
Then off you go, Captain. Right! And we followed behind in the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Day. Yes, yes, yes. How many knots are we making? Twenty knots an hour. We appear to be going slow for twenty knots. Well, there are only granny knots. <laughs> anyway, I haven't got any more string. Aye! He's fallen in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> oh, yes, little Jim. Naughty Uncle Harry did that. <laughs> we don't want idiots on the ship. <laughs> Certainly. What's your address? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 dear listeners. I'd better save him. He might have the last line in the show. Yeah, catch this concrete life belt. Uh, <laughs> Dramatic chords, please, Walter. It was three months' journey to the Crimea, but by December the 43rd, Kran's giant leather bombardon was dug in and sighted on the walls of Russian-held Sebastopol. Major Bloodnock had also been sighted by a certain Captain Fitzgerald. It lies. So this is the bombardon, eh? What a terrible-looking monster. No, I make all that the bombardon. <laughs> what? What? You've spoiled everything. I spoiled everything? Yes, you see, I just loaded you. Bloodnock, sir. <laughs> Telephone message from Commander Ryhap Itch and Finch your whole crew. In for me, it's cute, that should have been. Yes. We must fire at dawn. It's a matter of life and click. You mean life and death? No, life and click. He hung up. Stop those naughty audience winning jokes. Remember, we fire at dawn tonight. Further chords, please. It's snowing. Nonsense. It just happens I have dandruff. Right. Uh, incidentally, the giant leather bombardon's ready for action, sir. Right. Put a case of licorice powder down the barrel. It's been done, mate. Right. Men, take up position. Point it towards a large portion of the submersible wall. Ready? <laughs> we now go over to Sebastopol Wall to hear the arrival of the missile. <laughs> Oh, mate, wow. Mariachi, prepare for the payoff line, then run. Right. We've been fired. <laughs> hey! Well, there it is. Makes you mad, doesn't it? That was the Good Show. BBC recorded program featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seagum, and Spike Milligan, with the ready to quartet and Max Geldray. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan, announcer Wally Spin Slade, the program produced by Charles Chilton. Again, welcome to Your Song Parade, half an hour of glorious musical boredom with songs that your mother loved and everyone else hated. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis Main. Tonight I am including in my repertoire Schubert's violin sonata, guest soloist Billy Hugh Scott. <laughs> and now, request spot. My first request comes from Jack Blonger, a two-headed Mongolian criminal tram driver... <laughs> who is under treatment for the dreaded emotion of the legs and the green lurgy. Cheer up, Jack. I'm all right. <laughs> and here is your song, and it's called... Oh, I'm alone to be my own, alone, my love. 
to find your caressing song divine and you are mine I wonder how my love We regret to announce the sudden death of the well-known BBC tenor. The well-known BBC tenor, Webster Smogpule. The program and the death were recorded. The next program follows in one second. Here is the next program. With Patrick Sellers, Isaac Seacombe and Tom Milligan, we present... The Greatest Mountain in the World, or... I knew Fred Groot, or... The Greatest Mountain in the World... This story opens in the basement of a disused fish squirting factory. <laughs> there, during a meeting being held by the Royal Geographical and Archaeological Society, a member is concluding his speech. He's got one digging, one covering up, and one looking for fresh places. And that's how King Tutan's car and two more discovered. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Sir Martin Wheeler. I don't wish to know that. <laughs> and now, please silence for the right and left, Honorable Sir Harry Tigu. President of the Young Tid Tiddle Po. <laughs> Honorary parole prisoner and twice winner of the Dartmoor Escape Medal. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Members, in view of Sir Edmund Hillary and Tiger Tenzing's great achievement last year, I have decided to go one better. I intend to climb the highest mountain in the world. What is all right? I have discovered a higher one. <laughs> what is its name? Well, I can't keep this mountain a secret forever. It's bound to leak out eventually. I'll tell, and you're the first men to hear it. It's called Mount Everest. Pardon, pardon, sir, but the mountain has already been climbed. Hooray. Climbed? Climbed by whom? Hillary and Tensing. Hooray. My goodness. So, they've climbed Mount Everest as well. What a dirty trick. <laughs> Never mind. I'll not be defeated by this dishonored stratagem. I will find a higher mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and where are we going to find this higher mountain? Where? Well, uh, 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 boss, boss. What, Ellington? Why don't we build a higher mountain? Build a, our own mountain? Yeah. What rubbish? Get out. <laughs> Has he gone? Yes. Good. Gentlemen, I have a brilliant idea. Why don't we build our own mountain? <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Okay, buddy. Yes. Yes. Now, where, where will we build this mountain? <laughs> yes, Mr. Crumb? I think we should build it in Hyde Park. Why Hyde Park? Well, it's handy for the buses and shops. <laughs> Hyde, uh, Hyde Park. Um, any objection? Oh, yes. If we build this mountain on England, England would sink under the weight. Sink? In that case, this mountain would be invaluable. People could climb up the sides and save themselves from drowning. <laughs> Mussy, you're right. Hurry and build it before we all drown. Splendid. Who will second Mr. Crumb's idea? I will. Anyone else? Yes, me. Excellent. <laughs> Mr. Crumb, your idea has one for both. I thank them. I walk in the shadow. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> on Monday, then, we start cleaning Hyde Park. Cleaning that, we'll start on Monday. If not, in Hyde Park on Monday. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Work began, and a great area in the park was cleared. The method was very simple. One digging, one filling in, and one looking for fresh places. <laughs> Foreman Frankly! <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> now, did you drain the water from the serpentine? Arr, and we filled it in with solid concrete. Concrete. Good. That's very good. What a beautiful morning. Oh, cream oil. And would you all push the shack my body? Oh, what a beautiful morning. Eccles. Yo? What are you doing? Having a good time. 
having a good time? How do you get that lump in your head? I just dived in the serpentine. <laughs> dived in? Did you know it was solid concrete? No, but I know now. <laughs> in any case, I wouldn't dare dive in a pool with water in it. Why not? Oh, can't swim. <laughs> Oh. Look, look what I've got in this little box. Oh, it's a little lump. Yes, a lump. I put it on the ground. There. Now, I'm going to make a mountain out of that. What is it? <laughs> a mountain. <laughs> Anyone about here? Yes. What are you three laying down for? A very good reason. What's that? You just ran over us. <laughs> uh, are you Mr. Crumb? Only just. Well, this parcel on my lorry is for you. Oh, that'll be the mole for my molehill. Come on, help me lift it down. Oh, oh, oh I've got the old belt on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Good grief, it weighs a ton. Now, let's get the string cut. Echoes the scissors. Okay, here we go. How's that? Very good. But I didn't want a haircut. <laughs> ah, ah, here he is. The mole. Oh, yeah, look at him. He must be hungry. Yes. Here, boy. Here's a nice worm for you. <laughs> Thanks. Any more? <laughs> you idiot, Eccles. <laughs> that was for the mole, you <laughs> I say, are you, are you sure he's a mole? Of course he's a mole. Look, here's the letter. With love to our dear British friends from your pals, the Egyptians. There. Hmm. <laughs> if you don't believe me, read the label round its neck as proof. All right. Here. It says L-I-O-N. Hmm. L I O N Mole L I O Well, what does it say? No! <laughs> oh, you you silly man, you Ellington, do you think it's a lion? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Here, pussy, eat this. It's all for you. Put me down. The Greatest Mountain in the World, end of part one. Ices, chocolates, and Mac Gilbert. The Greatest Mountain in the World, Part Two. Now read on. Having escaped from the lion, work went ahead on building the mountain. Then, when it had reached a height of 10,000 feet, disaster. At midnight, Crun was awakened. Pardon me, is this your mountain, sir? Yes, I am part owner of it. I'd love to come down, you know. What? I'd like to come down. <laughs> It'll have to be this metal. But, uh, what? Who are you? Sex, male, name, Bog F. <laughs> Superintendent, Ministry of Works and Arzine. Section 9. No mountain weighing more than 8 pounds, 10 ounces, and measuring more than 20 feet, might be built within a radius of Nelson's column. What are you going to do? Well, I'll just put these little sticks at the base of the mountain and light the fuses. Hi. Oh. Is that all? Yes, that's all, thank you. Well, I'll better be going now. Well, good night, and a Merry Christmas. Thank you, and a Happy New Year to you. What a nice fellow. <laughs> now, what are these two red sticks he's stuck in here? Huh? Oh. <laughs> There's writing on them. Uh. <laughs> Dynamite! <laughs> 
Hallo? Ah, ah, hallo. Ho, 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 ho. Did I hear someone calling? Hmm. Something burning around here. Oh, what a bit of luck. Two big cigars and a boat lit. Mm. Let me see. What brand are they now? TNT brand. Hmm, must be a new make. I'll take a puff on one. Hmm. Hmm, strong. Well, I'd better nip the other one out and save it for later. The mountain's all gone. Oh, Ellington. I ain't Ellington. Huh? Oh, no, you're not. Yours wipes off, doesn't yeah. it? Oh, it's Eccles. Oh, you're Eccles. Yeah, oh, pleased to meet you, Eccles. Pleased to meet you. But the mountain blown to pieces. Oh, what's happened? Where's my mountain? Gone destroyed. Smashed to pieces by the Ministry of Works. We'll call an immediate meeting of the Royal Alpine Society. Hey, I'm never out, little Nicola. Help me all the time. Help me, and people have you heard of I have never out, this is. I have never out, little Nicola. I'm never out. Well, gentlemen, Lord Elphus has made it quite clear. We have no option. We have to start building another mountain in another country. I therefore call upon Major Badnock for advice. <laughs> and other disgusting noises. <laughs> gentlemen. I have the answer to this problem. Bravo, buddy! Silence, Miss Bannister, or I'll muggle your crampons with me grit clap. Oh. Now to biz. Mount Everest. It's five miles high, isn't it? Yes? Yes. But it measures 12 miles across the bottom. Well? Well, all we need to do is to tip Mount Everest on its side, and we'll have a mountain 12 miles high. How do you intend tipping Mount Everest on its side? Well, isn't it obvious? No. Then I have another idea. <laughs> Why don't we saw the top off Everest, insert a portion of some other mountain underneath, thus raising Everest another hundred feet? Mm, no. That huh? would be cheating. And against the Al international alpine laws. Gentlemen. Oh, uh, might I interpose? <laughs> I think. <laughs> I know of a mountain that is higher than Mount Everest. Oh. Well said, Echo. Thank you. Uh, this mountain is 33,000 feet high. And his name? Fred. <laughs> Mount Fred. There is, however, one snag. It is under the sea, 300 Kilgori fathoms down. Well, it's worth a try. Hands up those in favor. Well, now, gentlemen, it is decided we sail on an expedition ship to locate the sunken mountain. Eddington? Uh, yes, dear boy. Clear the deck. At your leisure. <laughs> The Mighty Mountain, Part 3. Read on. We fitted out a magnificent expedition vessel. To make the ship safe, we sent it by boat. And soon we hove to above the mighty Mount Fred. Lie the anchor. Okay. Shouldn't it have had a chain attached to it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it couldn't have been a very good anchor. Why not? It sank, didn't it? Ah, <laughs> uh, Major, sir, your secret deep-sea observation bathysphere, the X-9, is ready to be lowered over the side. Well, I'm afraid we can't use it. You see, there's a slight technical fault. What's that? The whole thing's useless. <laughs> However, I found another method of making forced meatballs. Forced meatballs? Yes. Major Bloodnock. We have not come 6,000 miles out here with all this ultra-modern submarine equipment and diving apparatus equipped for deep-sea mountain climbing to make forced meatballs? And why not? Because we've come to climb the highest undersea mountain in the world. Slice me, Dunger, and hell me, Iron Thudders. 
The blasted idiot thought of that. You did, sir. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> May I interrupt you for a second? Yes, what do you want? Nothing. I just want to interrupt. Get out of here, you naughty little boy, you. Oh, Major? you naughty little thing. Mage. What? According to our calculations, we're almost above Mount Fred. Then action! Fred! To climb this underwater giant, we shall need the following. Alpenstocks, skis, rope, crampons, crevices, grappling irons, and tents. Tents? But this climb is underwater. Hug me, you're right. Include umbrellas, raincoats, and Miss Myrtle Penelope Dimple. What's she for? I like the woman. How are we going to carry all the heavy equipment? Camels. Camels? Camels live underwater? That's mad. Of course, only mad camels could live underwater. <laughs> We're in condition tonight. Do you think I'm crazy? Yes. What a splendid judge of character this fellow is. Now, what next? Ah, yes. Provisions. Most important. Paraffin cookers for cooking paraffin. <laughs> You can't cook underwater. Of course not. We shall surface for all meals, you understand. <laughs> and now, how far is it to the base of the mountain? Uh, get ready, all you climbers. <laughs> uh, how do you intend getting down to the mountain? Quite simple. One digging, one filling in, and one... Uh, no, no, no. I mean, uh, I mean my famous fireman system. We lower a greasy pole over the ship's side, and we all slide down to the mountain top and plant the British flag. No, no, no. That will never do. What? That would be a foul. Uh, you can't climb down to get to the top of a mountain. The International Alpine Club states categorically that all mountains must be climbed up to get to the top. Flood me, cistern with galloping crabs. <laughs> you mean we've got to climb to the bottom and then climb up again? Yes. Flood. Uh, <laughs> How far is it to the very bottom? Approximately three miles. To be exact, three miles. <laughs> Much too far to walk. Everybody in the car will drive down. <laughs> Ellington, away we go. Right. To enable the story of the underwater epic to be continued, the BBC have installed microphones at the base camp of Mount Fred on the North Col and at the summit. Now, read on. Stop the car. We're lost, lost. Lord Seagram, ask a native where we are. Right, sir. I'll knock on this oyster. Yes? Oh. Is Pearl in? <laughs> Of course, you must be mother of pearl. Yes, yes, yes. Mother of pearl. Yes, yes, yes. Well, what do you want, buddy? Could you direct me to Mount Fred? I'm a stranger down here, buddy. You'll regret this, buddy. Oh. You can't fight with the British Empire, buddy. Yes, 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 Stop here, buddy. You buddy. Come on, Stephen. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Stop out. You ain't going to argue. Get in. Drive on, Ray. Okay. Hey. Oh, look what I met, an octopus. But don't stop to shake hands, we'll be here all day. <laughs> Drive on, Ray. He should have waited for us. <laughs> yes! Now we are hopelessly lost. Lost? Rubbish. I know exactly where we are. Where? Here. <laughs> I do believe you're right. I do believe so. Nevertheless, someone must surface and see where we are. Now, let me see. Who shall it be? Blue bottle! I heard you tell me, my Capitan. I heard you tell me. England is fair. Six hand up jumper in Lord Nelson pose. <laughs> Move the stage way. Blue Butler, I want you to get to the surface. The surface it should be, I just say. 
quickly puts on Elsie Steam men's not only bathing drawers. <laughs> I am ready, Captain. Pray tell me, how do I get to the surface? Yes, grab the horn to the submerged mine. Oh, jelly good. Here. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Do not mind go off bang. Of course not. Do your duty, Blue Bottle. I knew it was safe for me to do my duty, Blue Bottle. Moves forward over to mine. Grabs hold of horn. Very gently. Hi. <laughs> it is safe. I did not believe you at first, but now I know that... <laughs> Hello? Yeah, run and find you. you for Marilyn Monroe. I've got air bubbles in the seat of my trousers. <laughs> I see. Now, I've come down to tell you that the explosion has, has blown Mount Fred to bits. What? Curse. The only mountain taller than Everest and we, Georgie, would. Oh, that, that threw in our chances. Oh, no more more. <laughs> Never mind. Never, never, never mind. Here, oh, here, here. Oh, study. Have a cigar. Thanks. Hey. It's uh, one I got from that Ministry of Works fellow. Hmm. Strong, aren't they? Yeah. We regret to announce the death of Lord Seagoon, Mr. Crun, and Eccles. The program was recorded. Good night. Yep. Good night, folks. Have a good time. You're supposed to be deaded. No, I'm not deaded. Hurry up and be deaded, then you can go home for tea. Now, yeah, come on, Eccles, be deaded. No, I'm not going to be deaded. I'm not deaded. Not dead. Dead. <laughs> That was The Goon Show, a recorded program featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe, and Spike Milligan with the Ray Ellington Quartet and Max Geldray. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan, announcer Wallace Greenslade, the program produced by Peter Heaton. It is now proven that the cast were all deaded. The London Palladium is now appearing in Argyle Street. Argyle Street is also appearing there. Philip Harbin has not been properly deaded, neither has Kay Hammond. Now read on. Good evening, listeners. Wager's Playtime tonight comes to you from a head and foot mangling factory at Bill Gates. Among the artists are those three sons of fun, fresh from their triumphant palladium failure. Sellers, Seacombe, and Milligan in The Goon Show! <laughs> Thank you, Arturo Toscanini. The solo violin part was played by Vic Oliver on the drums. <laughs> Morris Winnick's book of party games is now on sale, priced two shillings at all good chemists. Listeners are possibly wondering what all this has to do with the great saxophone shortage in Tibet. <laughs> well, we shall see. <laughs> yes, we shall see, as we present, the collapse of the British Railway sandwich system. Oh! I was Mrs. Dale's Chiropodist <laughs> by John Bunyan. Or the collapse of Mrs. Dale's saxophone system on the Tibetan Sandwich Railway. Or...
Вышел сы. Our story opens in hell. The hell that drives many a normal person sane. The hell that we Londoners know as Clapham Junction Tea Buffet. <laughs> Into that den of vice stole a man, ragged, tattered, forlorn. His appearance told us what he was. Middle-class Englishman. <laughs> With a pounding heart, he approaches the counter and speaks. Can I have some service, miss? <laughs> There was courage for you. Miss, did you hear? Just a minute, can't you see I've only got one pair of fingers? <laughs> But I've got a train to catch. Hey, miss! Miss, did you hear? Do you want to buy a sausage roll? No. <laughs> well, stop banging it on the counter. <laughs> I want to complain about this sandwich. It tastes like muck. Muck? Let's see. Of course, it's a muck sandwich. <laughs> well, I wanted a mustard and cress one. Capitalist. <laughs> I'll get you one. Oh! Oh, here. Yeah. Someone's pinched all the mustard and cress out of the sandwiches. That was the first sign of the great mustard and cress shortage, which was to cause havoc to British railways. In other stations, there were similar disappearances. Investigations were commenced by your favorite midget, Captain Gladys Seacombe, sometimes called by the same name. Yes, Captain Seacombe. Magdalen College, Oxford, Keys College, Cambridge, Trinity College, Dublin. I know where they all are. <laughs> to investigate the mustard and crest disappearances, I called at several station buffets. I was with him. The man in black. <laughs> Together we approached the counter. Yes, constable? I'm no constable. I'm Sigun, plain clothes man. What do you dress like a policeman for? I'm in disguise. <laughs> Me too. Mm, I can see that, yes. <laughs> You're well disguised. Now, what do you want? A mustard and cress sandwich. Do you want bread with it? No, I don't like luxuries. Oh. Well, you've had it, I'm afraid. We ain't got no mustard and cress. How much should that be? Well, now, let's see. Mustard and cress sandwich with no bread. No bread with no mustard and no cress. One and six. One and six for nothing? Yes. That's very cheap. Have you a change of a hundred pound note? Yes. Marry me. <laughs> you too. Well, uh... Goodbye. <laughs> Come back. Ellington, this waitress, I'm suspicious of her. Man, you're right. Her moustache has fallen off. Yes, it was false. She isn't a woman. She's, uh... She's, um... What's the other sex? Man. Man, that's it. Man. You, madam. You're an imposter. You're not a woman. You are right, Capitaine. You are right. <laughs> Tis I, Blue Botule. <laughs> Arch criminal and master of the teddy tail junior disguise outfit. <laughs> Price two shillings at all good chemists. <laughs> you devil incarnate. What's your part in the mustard and crass shortage? I play the part of Blue Botule. <laughs> I, I have destroyed every mustard and crass place in the world. <laughs> I, moves dramatically up to counter. Strikes pose. Also strikes cheese dish. Blue Bottle, I arrest you in the limb of the gnaw. The, the, the limb of the lee. I arrest you in the numb of the loo. May I help? Thank you. He arrests you in the lom of the knee. <laughs> Thank you, John Snag. <laughs> Make sure you get it right. <laughs> Now, Blue Bottle, are you going to come quietly, or do I have to use earplugs? You shall not catch me. Hands up. Look out, Ellington. He's got a flash garden cardboard ray gun. <laughs> Ice two shillings obtainable at all good chemists. 
You will not tell me a lie. I'm perfectly willing to agree to that arrangement. But, but boss, that's a real gun. Don't get frightened. <laughs> Hide behind me. Where are you going? Behind you. <laughs> and now I destroy myself. Points gun to hate, as done by Alan Ladd in the Red Berry. <laughs> bang it, bang it, shoots head. Bang it, bang it, shoots heart. Bang it, bang it, shoots left ear off. Bang it, bang it, bang it, dies. And exits left to draw danger money. He's escaped us. We must report this. And England must be told that British Railways mustard and crass is no more. But first, let us hear Saxophones for Tabat by Max Gelray, price two shillings from all chemists. <laughs> Crazy man, crazy. <clears throat> Sorry. Next day, a stunned nation heard the dreadful truth. The old mustard and grass has had it, I fear. <laughs> Down with Billy Cotton. <laughs> but Captain Seagoon knew of one man who might save the situation. So to this man's farm he did journey, because this man was a farmer. He was very fond of animals. In fact, he ate nothing else. Chicken. Nice chicken. Nice chicken. 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 Oh! Minnie! What is it, Henry? Oh, dear, dear. The rooster's ill, Minnie. Why? He's just laid an egg. <laughs> Come down and see him, Minnie. I can't do it, Henry. I'm mending my saxophone. I think there's someone at the door, Henry. Do you? I'll just see, Minnie. Ah, oh, good afternoon. <coughs> Minnie. Yes, Henry? You were right. There was somebody at the door. <laughs> oh, you come back. Mr. Crump, will you stop opening and closing the door? What else can one do with the door? <laughs> I don't wish to know that. Now, may I come in? As you're already lying on the couch, yes. Now to business. Before you start, would you please mind taking your feet off the table? That's my place. Now to business, Mr. Crumb. You're a farmer, yes? I grow anything. Yes, you've got green fingers. And green feet. I'm going moldy all over you. <laughs> Just the man the British Railways need. Now I... <laughs> What is that? That's Miss Bannister. Oh, it sounded just like a saxophone. <laughs> Minnie! Yes? Don't play anymore, please. I must practice, Henry. After all, Ivy Benson can't live forever. What do you mean she can't? She has. <laughs> <laughs> British Railways want you to grow them 6,000 acres of mustard and cress in the Amazon. Oh, Minnie? I'm just going to the Amazon. Minnie? I should be a way of saying what you're talking about. I'm going to the Amazon for six months. Get the water and you put it on the map. And you say that. Leave your dinner in the oven. What did you say? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Meanwhile, in that distant land which Crun and Sigun were bound for, the British ambassador went about his duties. Hello, darling. Hello, my love. Nope, I'm sorry, Marilyn. I'm, uh, I'm busy tonight. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going out with um, Jane Russell tonight, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Can't help being handsome. Now then, 
No, I'm sorry, honey, I, um... After that, I'm going out with Betty Grable, yeah? Yeah. Eckhart! Just a minute, my dear blood knock. I'm on the phone to Marilyn Monroe. Carry on, darling. Now, then, what were you saying, darling? Tag me quick, Club. We haven't got a phone. I know we haven't. Then what are you doing? I'm having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. You idiot. Yeah? In any case, Miss Munro wouldn't be interested in you. She's married to Joe DiMaggio. I know. I was heartbroken when I heard the news. You see, I wanted to marry Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> oh, you... You poor fool. Oh? Joe DiMaggio is a man. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, well. Well, that's different. I hope so. <laughs> oh, never mind all this rubbish. Hmm? I say, any signs of the river steamer yet? No, no. Oh, 35 years out here in this grass hut. 35 years and no milk or papers delivered from England. Eccles. Yep. Do you think Gladstone's forgotten us? <laughs> oh, 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 brandy, brandy. Oh, I'm in a shocking state. I'm not in condition anymore. Oh, poor old blood knock. Oh. I think the Major is mad. <laughs> Little does he know that I am perfectly sane and that it echoes who is really mad. Oh, Little does he know that he is sadly mistaken in his estimation of me, as I am perfectly sane, and he, poor fellow, is off his nut. Little does he know that if he calls me mad just once more, I shall put a bullet through his head. That doesn't frighten me, because little does he know that I unloaded his gun, because I know he's mad, and I knew he might shoot me. That is why even now, as he points his gun at me, I'm not pinching because I'm sane. Okay, I'm mad, I'm mad. Pax, 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 no. Ahoy there! Oh, here, look, there's a man just come out of that bush. Dad, yes, he's dressed like a shepherd. Must have been shepherd's bush. <laughs> Hello there. Are you the British ambassador? I am, I am. Dad, you're the first white woman I've seen for 30 years. <laughs> There's an expedition due here in a few minutes. Coming to grow mustard and cress. In the meantime, gentlemen, be seated. Rub a dub dub. Three men in a tub. Cause you broke my heart in two. Ellington, well played. Fred Handel's Largo never sounded so good. Now, pardon me while I retire and change into my Mr. Crown outfit. Price two shillings from all good chemists. Wait, here comes Captain Seagoon with the expedition. Tad, yes. He's a sight for sore eyes. It's a pity I haven't got a pair handy. Ah, oh, good day, Major Budlock. Ah, pleased to meet you, Captain Seagoon. Welcome to, uh, where are we? South America. Welcome to what you said. And to you, my dad. You must have walked all the way. What makes you think so? Well, you, you're you like a midget. There's a very good reason for that. What? I can't stand heights. <laughs> Spoken like a pygmy. And talking of pygmies, have you any brandy with you? Crates of it! Welcome to South America, lad. you said that before. I know, but this time I really mean it. <laughs> now, let's get you settled. Yes. Ellington? Boss? We'll camp here for the night. But as a safety precaution, we must light large bonfires all around the camp. What for? Lions. Man, if the lions want fires, let them light them themselves. <laughs> Silly lad. The fires are to prevent the lions entering the perimeter. Okay, bonfire it is. That night we slept safely in the trees as the lions warmed themselves by our fires. <laughs> then at dawn, Eccles awoke. Oh! Forgot I was in a tree. <laughs> Get up, man. Stand on your own three feet. Are we ready to move off, Major? Yes, we've got to head inland. The first danger will be crossing the dreaded river Kabati. And that's very cold, you know. Yes, there's nothing worse than a cold Kabati. 
chestnuts roasting by an open fire. Pick up your luggage and sideways to the wind forward. Hey, it's getting hot, Ellington. Are you tired already? Yeah, I ain't very strong, you know. Okay, I'll take some of your load. Now, give me one of your pianos. Okay, thank Oh, uh, that's better. Thank you, Wellington. That's okay. I'm not too heavy for you, am I? <laughs> no, I'll put you down when I'm tired. Keep up there, you lazy devils. I say I'm not too heavy for you, am I, Ellington? No. Major, I'm not too heavy for you, am I? No. <laughs> I'm not too heavy for you, am I, Captain Seagull? <laughs> <laughs> We pause here to give listeners at home and in the street a recap of the situation. <laughs> if you remember, Eccles was supporting Ellington, Bloodnock, and Seagoon on his head. Suddenly, uh, Mr. Eccles has appeared on top of Mr. Seagoon, thus leaving all of them suspended in midair. <laughs> listeners, write down on a piece of paper what you think will happen. <laughs> Have you done that? Good. Now listen to what actually happened. You guessed it, they all fell down. <laughs> now, lead on. That night, for safety, we slept standing up. Some slept standing down, which is standing up sideways. Price two shillings at all good chemists. <laughs> then, as the sun came up, it started to get light. Ooh. <laughs> Before me lay a vast, stark, arid waste. It was me. <laughs> Seagoon, this is where we start planting. Right, Eccles? Oh. <laughs> where do you leave the box of mustard and cress seeds? Um, oh, I remember. <laughs> Here we are. Where was it? England. <laughs> boss, boss, there's a tribe of strange natives approaching. What? Yes. Leave them to me. Savage natives, are they? I shall show them. Hand me the white flag. <laughs> now, where is my Batwoman? You mean Batman? Those days are gone forever, lad. <laughs> ah, here she comes. Miss Plunger. Yes, Major Bloodnock, sir? Uh, Miss Plunger, remember when we were sinking in the Atlantic and there was no room in the lifeboats? I said women and children first. Yes. Well, remember what you did? Yes, made you up as a woman. <laughs> Stand by to do the same again. But look, I think you're nervous. What? Say that once more. You're a yellow-livered coward. That's better. <laughs> I knew you'd like it. Anyone for tennis? Oh, what am I talking about? Oh, you would. Oh, you would. Here, what? Ellington's gone after them natives with his gun. Splendid. Ellington's a dead shot. He is now. Somebody shot him. <laughs> I'll not stand here and see my men slaughtered. Eccles? Yep. What time's the next train out of here? No, Bloodlock, you must stay here and fight. Oh, very well. Your example has made me stay. Splendid. Eccles? Yep. What time's the next train out? I had that lead me thudders with a smother kit nud. You. Hey, if you're running away, I'm coming too. Ellington, are you turning yellow? <laughs> 
man, does it look like it? Oh, oh it's being Wait, I What? You were shot. You're dead. Mm. Oh, I wonder why I didn't feel well. <laughs> what about the mustard and crisp plantations? I'm not waiting here all night. <laughs> Oh, those natives are attacking. Everyone into the wooden hut. We haven't got a wooden hut. What? To work, men. Oh, <laughs> right. Everybody inside. <laughs> Good work, men. Now we'll... Hello? Have you any rooms to let? No. <laughs> now then. Radnock? Get outside and fight. Fight? Oh, my back and legs. Oh, my poor legs. Ellington, you go. Ellington! Where's Ellington? I'm afraid Ellington's gone home, kind sir. Ellington, take all those women's clothes off at once. Curse, I'm exposed again. How do you know it was me with all my disguise on? You made one mistake. What was that? Blonde wig. <laughs> it was a man's. <laughs> duck, men, duck! What? There's a native at the window. Ooh. Get down, get down. <laughs> Gad, that native was clever. Why? He only had a spear. <laughs> Men, there's only one chance for us. The riverboat. Keep your ears open for the hooter. Ah, oh, about time they installed it. <laughs> Hello? Yes, we are in a tough spot. Pardon? No, thanks. No, we'll, we'll see it through by ourselves. Yes, yes, I know you could, but we'll make it alone this time. Thanks. Alan Ladd. <laughs> Yankees, eh? <laughs> we didn't, don't need their blasted help. <laughs> Hello, Alan, lad. We accept your offer. Yes. <laughs> oh, never mind, Alan. The river steamer. We're saved. Outside, everyone. Look at those natives run. And here comes the steamer around the bend. Oh, no. It's Miss Bannister. <laughs> Alan, lad. We accept your offer, Alan. Yes, get us out of here. That was The Goon Show, a recorded program featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe and Spike Milligan with the Raynard and Quartet and Max Geldray. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan, announcer Wally Greenslade, the program produced by Peter Eaton. Listeners will ask what happened to the great mustard and cress shortage. Nothing. It still exists. If you doubt it, next time you go into a railway buffet, prize open a mustard and cress sandwich, and there you will find nothing. <laughs> Obtainable at all good chemists, price two shillings. Now, read on.